Hello, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, AMNH NOAA Data Visualization Webinar for Protecting Wildlife in a Changing Climate. My name is Mindy Weisberger, and I am a producer with Science Bulletins at the American Museum of Natural History. And I would like to introduce our moderator for today, who is Laura Allen, the Senior Editorial Producer for Science Bulletins at AMNH, and our Visualization Scientific Advisors, uh, Dr. Ned Gardner and Dr. Healy Hamilton. So we are looking forward to your participation during the course of this webinar. You will see that you have the opportunity for asking questions. We will pause for questions during the explanation, but we also encourage you to ask questions at any point during the webinar and, uh, and we will address them. So we will also be introducing additional materials and links and resources. So those will be provided, uh, those will be provided to you during the webinar and we will also be circulating them afterwards by email. And we are also going to be recording and archiving the webinar on Science Bulletin's website so it will be available to you afterwards. And with that, I am going to hand this over to Laura Allen, our moderator. Hello, everybody. I want to welcome all of you. Uh, we're so glad to have many of you on the line from other science institutions that, oh, hold on. Let me just show my screen here. OK. So we'll have, um, we have so many of you on the line from institutions that subscribe to science bulletins. Um, and for those who haven't heard of us, we're a video production group at the American Museum of Natural History. We cover current science through documentary videos, news animations, and data visualizations like the one we're going to explore today. Um, we also format our flat screen visualizations for spherical display. So for all of you that are joining us uh, from Science on a Sphere Network, uh, you'll um, be able to get a chance to use this visualization uh, formatted especially for the sphere. And I want to welcome all of you and all of the other educators and museum professionals that are on the line. So we have leading the webinar today, um, it's a terrific pair of biologists, uh, Ned Gardner and Healy Hamilton. Uh, and as Mindy mentioned, they worked very closely with us to develop this piece. And they're real experts at using biological and climatic data to understand and teach about biodiversity and conservation. And they're really passionate, uh, so you're going to learn a lot from them today. Uh, Ned, in fact, was previously um, with us here at Science Bulletins for many years and actually brought the capacity to tell stories using data to this group and to all of the uh, visitors and, and other folks who use our pieces at museums and online. So he's now actually with uh, NOAA with the NOAA Pro Climate Program Office. He leads data visualization projects there. And he's also a collaborator on the NOAA grant, the Environmental Literacy Grant, that actually supports this visualization series and uh, also um, supports a program called the Worldviews Network, which he also works with Healy Hamilton on. So I'm really happy to have them both. Uh, before Ned um, takes the lead to, to introduce what we have today and, and introduce Ham, uh, Healy a little bit more formally. I just want to share with you the, the plan for the next hour. Um, Ned and Healy are going to have about a 10 minute introduction to the broad topic of climate change and wildlife. And then after that, we're going to be spending the rest of the hour going step by step through the visualization that we've developed on this topic. We focus on um, a highly sensitive species in this visualization, that's the wolverine, but also the visualization will um, speak to and bring up much broader topics um, that Ned and Hilly will touch on throughout. So for those of you who haven't actually had a chance to watch the visualization, on the screen here I've got some links where you can actually download it, watch it online. Uh, the SOS version is available on the links here as well. Um, and then for those who actually subscribe to the HD Science Bulletin uh, stream at their institutions, we're going to be launching this on screen tomorrow. So that will be appearing in your playlist tomorrow morning. And um, we're not actually going to go through the entire visualization here on the webinar. We're going to actually just show stills and explain use those as, as touching touch points to, to explain the topics in the visualization. Sometimes playback gets a little awkward. So um, I encourage you to visit 
the websites on the screen and, and download or look at it there if you'd like, or you can just follow along as we go through uh, each of the, the sort of overtures in this visualization to, to explore the data and the topics a little bit more uh, carefully. So um, as Mindy said, feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, I know many of you had some questions about, in the surveys that we had sent out earlier, had some questions about resources. I wanted to point out one particular resource that we have available on the website. Hold on. There it is. This is a backgrounder that we've developed which takes you deeper into the science behind this visualization and also has some resource links for you. This is available on the website for the piece, as well as in the FTP folder for the Science on a Sphere version of the piece. So as uh, we mentioned earlier, we'll also be sending out additional resources afterwards. Uh, and feel free to send uh, Mindy at the end of this any questions via email that you might have, and, and we'll pass those to Ned and Healy and uh, be able to follow through with any specific things that weren't addressed today. So. With that, I uh, pass the torch to Ned, and uh, welcome. Very much, Laura. Thanks, Laura, and hello to everybody. Um, I want to say right now, first of all, to everybody, please send your questions in and do interact through your chat window and question window, because Healy and I very much want to respond to your interests. We understand from the uh, registration um, that a lot of you are very interested in biodiversity issues. Um, second, I want to say that my internet connection, where I am, may or may not provide a problem. We, if you're having trouble seeing my screen or things that I'm referring to, please flag that for the organizers. And um, Laura will just take control back, and we will continue. Um, so we shouldn't have a problem. But when we first um, built the, uh, the bio wall at the American Museum of Natural History for Science Bulletins. Um, it's very important to me as science advisor for the program that we be able to talk about the geographic complexity of the planet and the fact that life is distributed non-randomly and that we as a species are modifying the conditions for life on a planetary scale. So when we had an opportunity to expand the library of things that the Science Bulletin program offers, I was very excited to reach out to Healy Hamilton, who's our special guest today and our um, scientific expert on the topic we're exploring today, which is really about ecological forecasting and protecting species in a changing world. Healy is a biologist who studies organisms from the genome all the way to the globe. And she brings a very special and important perspective as someone who does field work and computer modeling to help us all understand the influence of climate change as well as other factors in the global system, land cover change, to forecast where species are likely to be in the future. That's incredibly important because we've relied for the last century on using protected areas to protect the ranges and the critical habitat for species all over the planet. And that remains a central tenet of conservation biology. But with climate change and a changing world, we have to have adaptive strategies, ways of understanding where species are likely to shift so that we can protect them, not just now, but in the future. So that's really the topic of today's presentation. Um, Healy is um, a colleague of mine um, through, through research and because we're both very committed to helping people see the big picture about what's happening on the planet with biodiversity, which is the most demonstrable effect of global change that we can observe in our time now. So as we look at this first, as we look at this visualization, um, just know that as soon as we dive into the data about Wolverine, these are uh, Healy's results working broadly, collaboratively with um, scientists all across the country and around the world. 
And so please do ask your questions about methods and anything you might be interested in about biodiversity and extinction of species. Shall we dive in, Laura? Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Very good. Um, and I promise you'll, you'll hear from Healy in just one second. Um, the first few screens, the first few seconds of, the, of this visualization just kind of allude to the beauty of, of life on the planet and um, get, get you connected with the fact that species around the world really are where they are because of climate. So life is intimately uh, connected to the biological and physical template that our planetary system um, has established through, throughout the history of Earth. When we put the first data image on the globe, we are showing you evidence of our changing climate from observations around the planet. This is a data set called the Global Historical Climatology Network that NOAA um, curates. It's our official temperature record based on observations from stations that are gridded to a coarse resolution. So every um, box you see here is one grid cell for which several observations have been averaged together. And then what we do is we subtract off the long-term average of the temperature in that grid cell. And where you see red, you see places that were warmer than that climatological average. And where you see blue, those were cooler than the climatological average. So that's a lot to take in if you never looked at climate data before, but it's fundamentally important to how we communicate about the climate system. Important thing to remember here is red is warmer. These are observations. And then note in the legend that we're looking at springtime temperature. So this is that critical time, March, April, May. And we're looking at um, the a baseline of 1980 through 2009. That's a 30 year period. And th what this shows is that the 21st century so far is much warmer throughout the range of the wolverine during springtime. So that's critically important because wolverines um, need cooler temperatures. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Healy to tell us a little bit about wolverine biology, why springtime temperatures are so important, and why do we focus on this in the visualization. So Healy, uh, please join the conversation. Thank you so much, Ned. And thank you, everybody, for being online. Um, I think I'd like to just take a quick step back for one moment and, and share with you why we're talking about wolverines in the first place. Wolverines, for us, represent um, they're, they're an icon of cold adapted wildlife. Um, the visualization that we have produced about species response to climate change, we could have picked any range of species. And it's not just species of wildlife. When we talk about biodiversity response to climate change, we have to remember that all of our food crops are adapted to growing in particular climates. The vectors of diseases that can uh, infect humans are also adapted to particular kinds of climates. Um, medicines that we get from biodiversity, compounds that, that, we, that we are able to harvest from different species of plants and animals, those plants and animals grow in areas where they are adapted to particular climates. So when we talk about climate change influencing where species are distributed, this is not just a conservation question. This is a question about how are humans going to deal with the shifting distributions of species upon which our own well-being depends. From the perspective of cold adapted species, we thought wolverines were a fantastic example. We, we knew that the climate was changing more towards the north. We understand that 
climate change is going to be influencing cold adapted species disproportionately. And wolverine is a species of high conservation concern in the United States where its southernmost distribution extends into the Rocky Mountains. There are wolverine recovery plans and wolverines a listed species in several states. So and it's also just a fierce and ferocious example of a true wild animal. It's wolverines can actually back a grizzly off a kill. They're just so badass. So we chose wolverines as a cold adapted species that has conservation implications, but it's important to remember that uh, climate change is influencing species distributions around the world, and this has many implications for human well-being. So uh, um, I just wanted to give that little bit of background. The data that you're looking at here are, is a representation of the range of the wolverine, which is, you can see is, it circles the Arctic, essentially. It is a cold adapted species. And you can see as that um, little tongue of yellow that extends into the Rocky Mountains for where the species exists, that's its southernmost distribution, and it's found in the, in basically in the high mountains of the lower 48. And as you'll see in the visualization, once you have a chance to watch the whole thing, for those of you that haven't, wolverines have a particular link in their biology to climate. That is the that the wolverine mothers, as they are creating dens for their pups, need deep, deep spring snow in order to, um, they burrow really deep dens, like little snow caves, and that's how they protect, protect their young from predators. If there is not deep enough snow in the springtime, essentially wolverine mothers are, un, are unable to rear their pups. So this is a direct link between a changing climate that Ned's data here is showing um, is warming disproportionately in the spring months and the dependency that wolverines have for deep snowpack in the spring. So a direct connection between wolverine biology and climate. Healy, we had several people very interested in data. So I want to point out that um, we've taken some time to make these data available in a um, science on a sphere format, which is just a way you can wrap a global image onto a globe. You could use science on a sphere, you could use other visualization environments, but essentially we took the previous frame and made it available in that format. You here see the Wolverine range throughout the boreal region, and you see the legend for the data showing spring temperature anomaly relative to the average from 1980 to 2009. So there's a lot of data in here. And um, Healy, how do we uh, how do we collect data about wolverine or any other species? And their essentially, yeah. I mean, um, our understanding of where species are distributed comes from really hundreds of years of natural history observation. And museums like the American Museum of Natural History contain tens of millions of specimens that are detailed observations of what species occur where on the planet. And most of those natural history collections were, in fact, built when the climate was quote unquote normal. So that they occurred in the 19th and earlier in the 20th centuries when species were distributed according to the climate to which human civilizations are adapted that has existed with relative stability over the last 10,000 years and is now rapidly changing. In addition, there's many more modern efforts to understanding where species are distributed. Um, today we have remote camera technology, we have satellite technology, we have citizen scientists who are helping us to understand what species are distributed where on the planet. So the data about biodiversity distribution comes from a large number of sources, but collectively they are people observing what occurs where at what time on the planet. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, which is where this Wolverine range data comes from, they, that is a data source that compiles many, many distributional data sets for species of global conservation concern. So it's a fantastic website, fantastic resource, and it is essentially the world's most organized body for trying to conserve global biodiversity. So um, 
uh, if folks have not heard of IUCN or tracking endangered species, I strongly recommend um, they check that out um, on the web. It's an amazing organization that's providing an incredible uh, service to humanity and other species right now. So check out the Red List and IUCN. Um, Healy, we were looking at a really broad range a moment ago, and right now I've got on my screen, hopefully everyone else can see it. Yeah. Um, I've got an image showing prime habitat, and our visualization really focuses in on this issue of prime habitat. Could you describe what that means and why that's different from that range map? Yeah, absolutely. So the range map is showing you the global, very coarse level distribution of where we think wolverines occur. Now we're zooming in to ask a very specific question. What are the climate requirements for wolverines in the southernmost end of its distribution, the lower 48 states? So what we've taken, what, what you're looking at here is the result of a model. We call it mapping prime habitat. It's technic technically, it's called bioclimatic envelope modeling. What we've done is we've taken the known verified records for where wolverine occur in the lower 48 US states only. And we have said, what is the climate at all of those locations collectively? So from Glacier National Park down to the Southern Rocky Mountains, everywhere that someone has seen a wolverine, we've collectively taken all of those localities and we've asked in every month of the year for temperature and precipitation, what is the combination of like hot, dry, wet, and cold across the year that a wolverine needs to survive? And we have then projected that particular envelope of climate, the, the, the combination within which Wolverine can survive. Let's and take that idea that. of envelope for just a second more because this is a fairly complex term with a lot of syllables. So bioclimatic envelope, you're really talking about a lot of different variables. And 36, the, right? Max, yeah, every month, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and precipitation. So the three basic climate variables for each month and wolverines live within a particular, um, a particular envelope, and a, a subset of all possible values that are so the let's, ones let's that help, they let's help Let's help people just walk through that for just a second. So like if we imagine one variable, there might be a minimum and a maximum for that variable that a species depends on for temperature, let's say. And then That's on another axis, right. we might have like elevation. And on another axis, we might have springtime snow melt date and on another axis so it's a multi-dimensional envelope and, and it, that's yeah that's right it has some very clear thresholds for example uh, wolverines are essentially never found in places where late summer temperatures get above 70 degrees Fahrenheit that is a threshold for wolverines so we can immediately eliminate all of the areas where summer temperatures climb regularly above 70 degrees because that is beyond the tolerance of a wolverine. That's really helpful, I think. So if people have more questions about bioclimatic envelopes, please throw them at us. We need, we need to hear if you have questions about that. Sorry to interrupt you, Healy. Let's, let's carry no. on. No problem. So the yellow map that you're looking at is essentially a modern projection of where the combination of temperature and precipitation variables that wolverines need to survive can be found. It's not where wolverines live today. It's where the climate exists that wolverines could live within according to our best computer models. Um, so we can probably move on. Okay, so um, I think that's a, that's a really good point to clarify, though, that that is sort of, we're t when we say prime habitat, we're talking about the best possible places for wolverine to live. From so a climate perspective, only climate. So it's important to recognize that these models are, an, are essentially a correlation between where wolverines live today and the climate at that area and then projected into geographic space. It doesn't have, it doesn't say, well, is there going to be enough food there? 
Are there going to be enough trees there? Are there going to be predators or parasites that are going to keep them away? So biological interactions that often have a large influence on where species exist are not included in this model. This is simply the areas where climate exists in the lower 48 that wolverines could live within. So in and short, this is it's our a prediction just of the climate space and requirements. It's not necessarily, it does not include the biological interactions that are also important. So it is not a prediction of where you will find wolverine. It is a map of where the climate conditions are sufficient. And this is them. essential to map the current, the current distribution of the climate needs of wolverine today if we want to understand how climate change might influence the distribution of, of wolverine's climate needs. So well, that's a really good lead in. A modern to, baseline. So that's a great lead in to the next section of the visualization. And when you watch it in motion, it's got a, you can watch this progressing more slowly. But if we step forward in time to the year 2040, um, in our visualization, you'll see purple areas where we've blocked out some of that yellow prime habitat. And Healy, how do you come up with that prediction of lost habitat, which is in purple? So in our lab, we take the outputs from many, many different climate models that have been vetted for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, sort of the UN body that is the world's uh, source of climate model data suggesting what kind of climates might exist where in the future. And we take that information and we run all kinds of different, um, each of these different models we examine for their impact on where the climate envelope of a wolverine might survive. And then we average across all of them. So here, where you see the purple infringing upon what was yellow in the current time flight, it's where um, an average of 16 different global climate models suggest the climate wolverines need that they have today will no longer exist in those areas that are purple. That climate space that wolverines need to thrive will be lost, whether it's summer temperatures that are going to increase over 70 degrees or a decrease in spring snowmelt. We're looking across all the different variables of temperature and precipitation for every month. And here, climate space will be lost in the 2040s, and then we can project into the future, further into the 21st century, and see how that change is modeled to progress. So before we keep going into the future, we did have someone ask a question about past distributions. Do past observations of the occurrence of wolverine factor into these maps of prime habitat? Absolutely. It's essential to understand historical distributions from historical observations. That gets fed into the data set that we use to establish their baseline climate needs. So we probably have 350 point localities of wolverine observations to create our original baseline climate envelope for wolverine. And many historical observations are incorporated into that baseline observation data set. Great. So for the person who asked that question about the Sierra Nevada, and um, they were really wondering had, had they been observed in the Sierras previously. So I um, hope that addresses your question in terms of how these maps are derived. We need to kind of keep moving through, and I want yeah. to get out to the end of the 21st century. We see that that finger that you pointed out earlier in the broad distribution of wolverines um, it's getting pretty much eliminated under this scenario for climate change. Looks like there's that's, just a few islands right. left. So th one of the reasons we chose wolverines is because they are um, so important as a representative cold adapted species, representing the state of many other potentially cold adapted species, such as lynx or white bark pine or of other species that are very cold adapted that are facing a dramatically changing climate under current rates of greenhouse gas emissions. So here we've moved all the way to the end of the century. 
we're using mo climate models that have been run under a business as usual greenhouse gas emission scenario that is steadily increasing greenhouse gas emissions throughout the entire 21st century. And what we find is by the end of this century, the climate we know wolverines need to survive has shrunk into these little isolated pockets. But wolverines, like lynx and like many other animals and even some plants that are good dispersers, they can move through areas of inhospitable habitat if they can get to another place that is, um, that is still suitable. So these islands, it's essential to link them. And that's something we'll touch upon a little bit later in the webinar. But you are seeing under a current scenario of rapid increase in greenhouse gas emissions throughout the 21st century, the shrinkage of the habitat that wolverines need to survive. So I want to just throw in one, one detail, and I guess from my personal experience, of how we can ground these predictions in our own observations a little bit. Because up here, we can see the region covering Glacier National Park on the border between Canada and Montana. And um, I visited there in the early 90s and was really shocked at how much glacial retreat had happened there. Well, it's been suggested in the, in the journal Bioscience very recently that um, the glaciers could be gone from the national park in 2020. So, you know, that's just one um, observation, but a very stark one telling us about um, climate change as we see it. And so we can imagine the host of other factors that would affect wolverines. And I want to emphasize, and we're going to get into this in another moment, that this is one scenario looking out to 2090. Um, Healy looked at a host of scenarios to, so we can kind of bracket potential futures. So um, when climate modelers talk about scenarios, they take different potential pathways of human decisions and then put those scenarios um, into play with global climate models that link the ocean and atmosphere, simulating the effect of enhanced greenhouse gas emissions under different pathways and they run these simulations to look at the climate impacts of those different human decisions and climate modelers will tell you that the human decisions are the one factor they have the least certainty in so we're looking here at a side by side of two scenarios that Healy looked at would you tell us a little bit more about the scenarios and what they imply for the biology of wolverines Absolutely. So the scenario on the left that we've already visited, that is what the yellow is what's left of the suitable climate for a wolverine at the end of the century if human beings do little or nothing to change the rate of greenhouse gas emissions, so accumulating steadily um, over the rest of the century. On the right is the choice of a different future. If humans decide that they want to transition to a greener society, they, this future suggests that climate, or, excuse me, that carbon emissions stabilize around mid-century and then begin to rapidly decrease between mid-century and 2100. So it's still uh, accepts that there will be more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but many, much fewer uh, a much lesser concentration by the, twi by the end of, of this century. And you can see the huge difference that this makes for the suitable climate of the wolverine or other cold adapted species. There's much more area remaining in 2100 where a wolverine can find a suitable climate. Um, if, we, as, if we today make the decision that we are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions over this century. So really, it's an effort to try to help people understand the link between our actions today and the future for, for species, for biodiversity, um, later in this century. A simple way it's, of saying that is, is uh, it's really the future is not written. We do 
know that the choices we make will have impacts and we have pretty good ways of looking at the potential impact of those choices on biodiversity. That's right. So our actions today will influence biodiversity tomorrow and this is not just wolverine. This is where food is going to grow. This is where your new medicines are going to come from, fibers, fuel wood. This is a really important issue beyond, uh, beyond wolverines, although they represent our example here. And that's really um, the motivation of your work, isn't it, Healy? Is being I able have to, too much. To be able to help people understand um, the potential impact of our, our choices on future biodiversity. That I essentially have two motivations. One is to provide the scientific support required from ecological forecasting so that conservationists and managers have clear steps to take in order to help climate, in order to help species adapt to a changing climate. And the other main objective is to use our research to communicate to the general public about climate change impacts to species. Um, because in, in many ways, if you can see it through the lens of plants or animals that you care about, it may be a way to uh, become engaged and become informed. So both visualization and, and conservation research are our motivation. Well, you mentioned management, so let's kind of take a bigger picture uh, zoom out a little bit and think about the uh, potential um, decisions we could make with this information. So I'm, I'm showing now a map of the um, potential future prime habitat in yellow, which is the same scheme we've used all along. And then we've overlaid in green the current protected areas. Now, I mentioned early at the beginning of the of the webinar that protecting um, that protected areas are the prime strategy for uh, managing for species of concern, protecting their habitat. Um, but we're suggesting another idea in this image. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this? And what I'm going to do is zoom in just even a little bit more here, and you can describe what we're looking at. Um, you should be seeing an image showing much of um, from Alaska all the way down through the Rockies. If you so don't see that, let me know. Is, um, this is a, there's a couple different things to talk about with respect to this image. One is the fact that much of our existing protected area actually covers what we might call the core climate refuge for the wolverine. That is, we have done a good job, and we, we didn't design it this way, but in fact, we have protected many of the habitats that the wolverine um, will, or is projected to find suitable climate in the future. But these isolated little pockets of green will, will un, are unlikely to maintain long-term viable populations. They're going to need to exchange genes with one another, they're going to need to disperse, find new habitats, colonize new areas. And that is the concept of connecting these yellow areas, which are um, modeled climate refuges, if you will, for the wolverine. And so there is a very important movement afoot in the conservation community to support biodiversity adaptation to a changing climate that is grounded in the principles of connectivity conservation. That is, we have to manage for isolated populations of plants and animals to be able to move around um, and colonize new sites. And this idea has been around for a very long time. We know that an isolated small population eventually may not survive, but if just a few migrants can get in and out, it has much better long-term prospects. These are solidly grounded in the principles of conservation biology as a science, even in the absence of climate change. But now, given a, ch a changing climate, we are already observing plants and animals shifting their ranges in response to climate change. And so the importance of their ability to shift ranges um, through a matrix of habitat that will allow them to find one protected area to the other 
has much greater importance in today's world. So connectivity conservation, firmly grounded in the principles of conservation biology, is now being embraced as a central strategy for helping biodiversity adapt to climate change. And this particular example of connectivity conservation is called the Yellowstone to Yukon Initiative, Y to Y for short. And there's over 300 partners, tribes, states, it, it covers two countries, counties, NGOs, land trusts, academics. Uh, there are uh, federal governments. There's a very, very many partners that are coming together to manage the matrix around the protected areas to facilitate plant and animal survival in a changing world. Okay, so before we go on, and we're sort of getting to the end of the main points of the visualization, um, um, I want people to know that we really want, uh, we're emphasizing here that our management choices include certainly greenhouse gas emissions, but that this landscape management strategy of connecting, of making corridors through which wildlife can pass in order to connect habitats is something we can do that'll help regardless of the future climate, uh, help wildlife exchange genes and um, have larger ranges. So um, we did have two questions, Healy, dealing with long-term perspectives. One question is what was the range of wolverine of, you know, beyond the recent past. And so let's say before the Holocene, what was, what was the range of the wolverine? And then someone else asked, do we run climate models past the end of the 21st century? So I'll take the okay. second question first and just mention that um, climate modelers t run the models past the end of the 21st century, but only to evaluate whether they're stable models. They don't um, try to anticipate future climates beyond the end of the 21st century um, due to the multiplicity of factors that we just really don't have a handle on primarily human decisions. Um, but let's, um, let's think a little bit about the long-term past as well of wolverines th themselves. What was their range in the Pleistocene? So the range historically of wolverines has fluctuated with the glacial interglacial cycles that North America and that much of the, of the northern hemisphere has experienced. We mostly know that from a spotty fossil record of skulls that are collected here and there. But in, uh, there are fossil wolverine skulls in areas today that are far south of where they occur but under glacial conditions, which happened cyclically several times across the last couple million years, um, wolverines have been able to extend their range south during glacial cycles. But we're really trying to emphasize what is their baseline range in, across the Holocene, which is the last 10,000 years or so. It's a climate in which all human civilization evolved or, uh, and that, and what we would consider the baseline climate for the distribution of current biodiversity that is now being affected by a rapidly changing climate. So um, we also had a question um, on this topic of connecting habitats. Um, could you cite some efforts by private citizens working with governments to make things like Y2Y um, happen? Um, I know Absolutely. you've been involved in some of those efforts. I mean, connectivity conservation doesn't only happen at this 3,000 scale, you know, international uh, effort of Yellowstone to Yukon. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we have a Bay Area connectivity project where we are literally trying to strategize about climate change influencing how species can move around on the small spatial scale of just the 10 Bay Area counties and looking at where do we prioritize our next conservation acquisition or um, management of oak woodlands that are in private lands or agricultural lands or vineyards up in Napa and Sonoma County. 
And the local land trust and the local open space district have a large amount of citizen involvement and are essential to supporting those land acquisition or land easement strategies. So that's many something everyone on yeah. the phone could look into is what's happening locally around uh, land trust activities and land conservation and connecting. What about, um, what about freedom to roam? Can you tell people a little bit about that? Freedom to Roam was an initiative of Patagonia, the clothing company, which is a very environmentally involved company, um, recognizing that uh, this exact issue that we are talking about today, that we have drawn static boundaries around protected areas in regions of high biodiversity value, assuming that the climate is stable and the plants and animals that live within those protected areas will stay there. And we now know with a changing climate that animals and plants are shifting their distribution. Freedom to roam essentially popularizes the message that we need to give animals the room to roam or they are not going to be able to survive within the confines of the protected areas that we've established to keep them safe. So um, Freedom to Roam is very much in support of the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative. And in fact, there's now an even larger initiative popularized by a book that was just released two weeks ago called The Spine of the Continent. And that extends Yellowstone to Yukon all the way down into Mexico. So through the Central Rockies, through the Sky Islands of New Mexico and Arizona, and into the mountains of Northern Mexico. Um, this is a 5,000 mile corridor now called the Spine of the Continent that Freedom to Roam is supporting. And some friends so, of mine are working on the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor as well. So there's the potential to extend that spine all the way through South America. All the, all the way to South America. And we're not the only country that's involved. Australia is way ahead of us. They've actually legislated two corridors, a north-south corridor along their eastern coast and an east-west corridor along their southern coast. Um, so Australia has already recognized the importance of uh, connectivity conservation at the scale of a continent. I'm, that's interesting you mentioned Australia because um, I know several people are interested in um, marine protected areas. I know Australia has been incredibly, uh, uh, has been an important leader in coral reef conservation because of the importance of the Great Barrier Reef to their economy. But um, we're, we're zoomed out now looking at protected areas around the world and we see a lot of marine areas also highlighted. Um, what, are, what are we doing as a species? What are humans doing to protect marine environments and species? So I'm, I'm glad that you asked that because uh, we don't intend to be overly terrestrial, although uh, the choice of species we focused on was terrestrial. In the marine environment, dispersal is a much more natural and much, sort of much more free-flowing process. It's not that hard to get around in the oceans. With respect to the oceans, it's not so much just changes in temperature and precipitation as it is changes in temperature and acidity of the ocean that are the main causes, uh, the, sorry, the main influences of climate change. So what we recognize now in the marine systems is that protected areas really work. There's a tremendous amount of evidence that if you enforce a boundary around a marine area and limit negative human impacts there, nature is incredibly resilient and will bounce back. However, the amount of protected area in the oceans is less than a tenth of the protected area on land. So we have a huge, um, there's a huge need for us to, um, sorry about that. Um, there's a really important need for us to um, actually in, expand the amount of marine protection that is available. And there's a huge effort. Um, right now it's called 20% 20 by 2020. So a call to global communities around the world that by 2020 they want 20% of the oceans protected, and there's only about one and a half percent right we should, now. So we should probably uh, emphasize too that the protected areas are concentrated around coral atolls, around coastal areas, and that the pelagic ocean remains 
the open ocean, the deep ocean remains um, a wilderness that's not all. well understood, where law is not applied, and where um, there's really no jurisdiction for people to enforce laws. So the ocean is critically important in the biodiversity conservation um, portfolio, and it's it's something that gets ignored because people think it's so vast often and tend not to think about um, the sensitivity of the ocean to just how much we're extracting from it, how we're polluting it, and so forth. But I do think it's essential to close the marine discussion with that the idea that we now know scientifically marine protected areas work to save the productivity and functioning of ecosystems, and that this is something that each of us can demand of our, you know, of our representatives or support in any way by working with different um, conservation organizations. That expanding marine protected areas is essential to protect wildlife in a changing climate. Absolutely, and and really, our motivation, Healy and I, wanted to put this visualization together with Laura and Mindy in the museum because we want people to know that, that, that protected area management is something that is a win-win strategy. It's something that improves resilience of ecosystems around the planet in the face of all manner of global changes. Um, I'd like to, yeah, can I just emphasize yes. very briefly that one last statement. Many people try to understand what it is that they can do in the face of this information. And there's one, for me, there's one central take-home message, and that is that we are not talking about choosing between biodiversity and human well-being for the future of our planet. We are recognizing that not only is biodiversity essential to human well-being, it is essential to addressing the impacts of climate change. Trees suck carbon out of the air. Mangrove forests improve um, coastal stability and will prevent human infrastructure from the damage of future sea level rise, while mangroves also create habitat for important fish, while they also suck carbon out of the atmosphere. There are many, many examples where biodiversity is actually the tool that we need to wield to uh, help solve the issues of climate change and improve habitat for biodiversity and improve human well-being. So biodiversity is really part of the win-win-win in this equation, and that is a central take-home message. Great. So I, I imagine most of the people on the on this call, on this webinar, are actively involved in helping other people understand biodiversity, global change, or systems, and so forth. And um, we wanted to let you all know that there are some resources for finding biodiversity information that you can dig into um, we were talking before the webinar and um, a lot about sort of how to use this information and it really does require somewhat of an expert um, perspective to apply the information. But if you want to check out a, a user-driven and easy-to-use site, check out databasin.org. That would be one useful resource. Are there some other, Healy, that you'd like to pass on to people? Because I know that we had a lot of questions and interest in where to get more data um, so that people can use the data in their work. So while she's answering, we'd like to hear from people about anything we left unanswered and what you'd like uh, information about. Um, so databasin.org is a very user-friendly uh, location where there's thousands of data sets about biodiversity and about climate and it's, um, it's pretty user-friendly. It does take a little bit of investment but there you can search in very clever ways for data sets and so I highly recommend looking at databasin.org. There are many different sources of, of information that, that tend to be a little bit overly technical um, there's the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF for short, has over 3 million records of where species occur on the planet, which is a, a huge resource that we use all the time. Uh, IUCN, the International Union of the Conservation of Nature, we mentioned earlier. Another excellent source for species data is an organization called NatureServe. They really, at least in the Western Hemisphere, have a tremendous amount of information about where species are distributed. 
Uh, and so with respect to climate information, I think I'd defer back to you, Ned, as far as the easiest way to access different information on climate. The very easiest is, of course, the website I work on, climate.gov. Um, but um, f and at that site, you can find links to a host of other um, resources. And um, you can get in touch with the folks, Mindy and Laura, at the Museum of Natural History if you have any questions or follow-on need for um, additional resources. They can try to help you, or they can direct questions to Healy or me to, um, to get you specifically what you're looking for. I would be really gratified to hear from people and to hear whether they're using this visualization and how they're using it. Um, so with that, maybe I'll turn it back to Laura. Um, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Healy, I want to thank you so much. It's been really a pleasure working on this project with you, and your work is so important. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Thanks so much, Ned and Healy. It's, it, that was awesome, and uh, this has been a great experience working on this visualization with you all, and, and hopefully there will be so much uh, use that folks can get out of it. And uh, like, like everybody said, please uh, send an email to Mindy. It's mindyw at amnh.org if you have additional questions that we can pass to Ned and Healy and help answer. A few folks asked about related Science on a Sphere data sets. And I just sent one through the chat window. Um, this was one uh, we did last year highlighting the effects of climate change on marine, uh, marine organisms, coral reefs. And so that's a, a great one to check out if you'd like to broaden uh, the use of this particular visualization to include other types of species and other environments. And then there's also lots of uh, other data sets, including uh, this one about global temperature anomalies that you might be able to incorporate uh, data sets from that uh, on, a, on a facilitated program that you could uh, incorporate uh, this wildlife, protecting wildlife in a climate, a changing climate visualization. So People should put in requests for more about biodiversity and climate change from the SOS community. Yeah, there isn't that much actually. So these are the few that I found. So uh, we'll, we'll keep our eye on these topics. And uh, we create about four visualizations of, for this series every year. And we've got um, another about another year or so to go. So stay tuned to us for future visualizations that address not only biodiversity topics, but also earth science and uh, earth systems topics as well. So thank you, everybody. Uh, We'd love to get feedback to you about this visual, uh, this webinar. Uh, we're going to be sending out a link to a survey, so if you're so inclined, please fill that out and let let us know how this was for you and how we can uh, do more of this in the future and what you're looking for. So look for that. Mindy will send out an email as a follow-up. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to uh, Dr. Ned Gardner, Dr. Haley Hamilton, uh, to our moderator, Laura Allen. Uh, all of the links, uh, images, PDFs that were shared during the webinar will be circulated afterwards by email. And thank you all for joining us.